Another year of footy done and dusted in Collingwood are the new Premiers knocking off Geelong and will now be known for the next 12 months as the reigning Premiers. And this grand final was an absolute beauty. It will go down as one of the best in the 09-10 draw 2012 and 2018 kind of upper echelon areas when it comes to the best in modern times. And for neutrals watching, it was an amazing game to watch as well. And while, yes, some will go to social media and do their usual bit of complaining, being grateful for the game we've got is where I kind of stand on this topic. The Pies were fantastic. Brisbane were enormous. And to my Brisbane family, the fans that follow the Lions, I am so sorry that this is the way that your season had to end. And if it is any consolation as a Hawthorne fan, I know what it's like to drop a close grand final. And hopefully, for your guys' sake, you can have the kind of bounce back that my club did in the mid to early 2010s. Now, I've been reading some Fox footy and some AFL.com.au stuff about the rankings of players and rating the players, and yada, 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 yada. And sometimes when you come up with video ideas, sometimes you just need to do things better than what the mainstream media are doing. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. All 46 players are going to be put into tiers. They're going to be ranked and we're going to talk about it. It's going to be fantastic. I cannot wait to get into it. But before we do that, guys, I just want to let you know that there are going to be 46 plus opinions in this video. You're not going to agree with all of them. I would love for you to let me know what you disagree with down in the comments below. That would be fantastic and something that I would love to see. I love interacting with you guys in the comments section. So don't take it too seriously. These are just my thoughts. I've watched the game twice. One of them completely sober. One of them, especially yesterday, not so much. But I am really confident in these rankings. So I can't wait to get into it as we wrap up the 2023 season and look forward to a huge off-season and 2024. So let's start this off with those that had a dirty day. Now, some of these weren't the players' fault. You think of Murphy and Archie, who were subbed off, especially Nathan Murphy. We feel for him. He is a premiership player now, but it would feel a little bit strange, I think, with the way his day ended. Now, Brandon Stasevic was absolutely killed when he was up against Bobby Hill. He was okay-ish on Jamie Elliott at times throughout the afternoon, but the rest of his day was just not there at all. Feel a little bit unlucky for Jared Lyons here. Subbed on, didn't really have that much of an impact. I thought it was a very strange choice as sub in terms of the fact that he was just another midfielder, which sounds harsh, but the quality of player he is, it made sense, but they took off a half back and put on a midfielder. I thought that was a little bit weird, but it is what it is, but it's the guys who are the bookends of this that are going to be the most controversial. Now, the Jack Ginevan thing, I don't really care what he did at the races. I don't think anyone should, but we do live in a social media age where people need to stick their noses in anywhere it fits and come up with stories. It's a non-factor. And I agree with Jack. He's a premiership player now. Doesn't matter what you think. And that's true. Doesn't matter what we think. But the Billy Frampton one is interesting because if Collingwood had lost, every Collingwood fan would have turned on him instantly. But because Collingwood won, they're going to come and defend him. So you should. I love that level of patriotic ness if you will patriotism that's the word that i'm looking for around it collingwood fans defend billy that's fine he had a good first half when it comes to shutting down harris andrews if billy frampton and harris andrews both have bad days that's going to be a net positive for collingwood because harris andrews is best is better than billy frampton's best but harris andrews finished with more intercept possessions than anyone else on the ground had a really good second half you know, he's just, it, it, it's the fact of life. Now, Billy's a premiership player and can turn his middle finger up to anyone that wants to criticize him, and so he should. He's a premiership player. Billy has had a factor of a million times better AFL career than I could ever hope to, and I'm not here to bash the guy. But when you're ranking 1 to 46, someone's got to be 46, and I struggle to see how it's not the great man. But he's a premiership player now. I hope he got bloody blind on the weekend and he enjoys himself no one can take this off him no one should try to massive congratulations these three players had down days for mine and what i mean by down day is i don't really remember a single thing that they did and that includes on a second watch now will hoskin elliott played a nice enough role as that defensive winger as josh dacos and still side bottom attempted to be the attacking winger and i'll talk about one of those other wingers in just a tick but just didn't do a lot. Now, again, doesn't have to. Won a premiership. That's absolutely fine. Cam Rayner, I think there needs to be a discussion about whether he's at the Brisbane Lions long-term. This 
If you're going to be an impact per possession player, not only do you need to have possessions, but you need to have impact, and he just didn't. Uh, this trying to walk through tackles isn't really working, and I do feel for Jasper Fletcher here, the youngster. It's his first season, uh, he had a magnificent debut season, showed a lot of class, a lot of polish, and it wasn't up to him to try to win the game for the Lions at all. He'll be better for the run, and I'm sure if he does get an opportunity to get back to the big stage in September, I'm sure he'll be one of the better players. But it'll be a learning experience for him, and I hope he's better for the run as well, because he's going to be a fantastic player. Can almost book him in for 200 games right now. Played a role, these guys played a role. Mason Cox was the best hit-out ruckman on the ground, had 31 Around the ground, it was it was shaky from Big Mason. He dropped a few, uh, didn't quite have his kicking boots on, missing one. That was a little bit difficult, not a lot of distance, but a tight angle was falling away, so, yeah. But the man who's one of the most sure set-shot goal kickers, although he'd kicked 17-11 going into this grand final, which suggests that whilst, yes, still extremely accurate, maybe not as put the glasses down as he'd been in other seasons but apart from those two behinds and the hit outs around the ground didn't do a whole lot gave away a few free kicks but those 31 hit outs and the fact that he was able to get some territory going especially in that last quarter for the pies keeps him off the other two tiers i can't really justify putting him better on the list here in my opinion there are plenty of brisbane players who fit the play to roll kind of sector here guys like jamie elliott and josh dacos on this list yes played a role now, they might not be role players, but they played a role. And that's why putting these tiers together, I can kind of understand those that do want to disagree. And like I said, put them in the comments below. But Elliot played a role a little bit more defensively than he maybe should have, right? And when Bobby was going, Jamie competing to take goals off him would not have done the Collingwood forward line any good. Now, he should have taken a couple of chances. Of course, he should have. But I thought some of the defensive work he was doing on Ryan Lester and Brandon Stasevich throughout that second half was great. I thought he did a really good role defensively at times in a couple of contests on Calamar Chi as well. It wasn't exactly selfless, but once we sort of realized he wasn't going to be the number one man in that forward line, I thought he did okay. Now, was he the Jamie Elliott of previous games? No. And as it turned out, he didn't really need to be. And that kind of applies to Josh Dacos as well. Originally doing this list, I had him graded or ranked a lot worse, but as a couple of people have reminded me close to me, uh, just because he was my Norm Smith medal pick doesn't mean I get to be grumpy at him. And yeah, that's fair. That's justified. And, and this is where he is on the list. And again, 17 disposals. Whilst some things didn't really stand out and he did get caught with the ball a little bit, the Brisbane wingers didn't really have an impact on this game at all. And... Josh didn't do a whole lot wrong on the day. So, played a role, did his thing. Don't really mind what he did at all. And guys like Darcy Wilmot, Connor McKenna, you know, they did their thing for the Lions and, and had some nice moments. But again, they played their role. Should they have done more is a debate for another day. When you lose by four points in a grand final, I don't think we can start bashing the guys that weren't best on ground. And likewise, when you win a grand final by four points, I don't think we can call every player a genuine superstar. It's all about a balancing act, and that's what we're aiming for. And I think everyone on that list right there, just to give you a refresher, all played a role on grand final day. Road flashes, all these guys did. Lincoln McCarthy kicked a couple of goals. Zorko had some nice moments, some horrific ones as well, but showed flashes of being that mature player. It would have been really interesting to see Dane Zorko play a grand final in his prime, but he's definitely not that now, and hey, that is okay. We've also got Darcy Gardner, who I thought did a really good job on the likes of Maya Cech and the second ruck when they did play forward. Zach Bailey was the Norm Smith medalist a quarter time, and let me tell you, no one was happier about that than me as the biggest Zach Bailey fan on the planet. Isaac Quainall used the ball at 100%, so although he wasn't at his usual high disposal rebounding best, he was quality, not quantity, and did show times and signs of being ultra, ultra defensively sound. Did get burnt on one occasion, especially maybe a couple, but I didn't think he did a whole lot wrong. And I think we've got to give a lot of credit to Pat Lipinski. One of the more underrated performances came on as the sub. Collingwood lost a key defender in Nathan Murphy. Lipinski did nothing wrong and showed some toughness that I don't think Collingwood fans especially would get, would have given him credit for, sorry, coming into this game, but he definitely showed those signs, and I thought as far as a sub goes, that was almost the perfect substitutes game for a grand final, didn't need to win the game, did nothing wrong, ran really hard defensively, 
Huge tick. Had a good day. These guys had good days. Now, again, I know the one that stands out here is probably going to be Lockie Neal because did he play like a Brownlow medalist in a grand final? Not really. Did he play a good role as a midfielder? Yes, he did. He really did. I didn't think the midfield battle was that close. There were periods of momentum, don't get me wrong, and Lockie Neal's first half was certainly very quiet. One of the guys who had to lift and thought he did in that second half. Again, he wasn't elite. He wasn't very good. He was good. He was good. I don't think that's outlandish to say. I also don't think I needed to repeat myself there, but a la, here we are. Darcy Cameron, I think, was the best ruckman on the ground around the ground. If you take the full work of what he did, the full body of work of what he did, sure, he only had, I think it was 18 or 19 hitouts, but around the ground, his competing in the air was really, really good. He was really clean below his knees on a couple of occasions. I've got to give him a tick there. And Oscar McInerney, for mine, was the best ruckman on the ground. Had 27, 28 hitouts, had 10 clearances. Sure, some of those were hat kicks that were turnovers. I understand that. But a grand final sometimes is just about taking territory. Brisbane won three grand finals in a row in the 2000s doing that. So getting that territory forward was key, but thought Oscar was the best on the ground. Another guy who stands out on this list is Bo McCreary. He had an almost day. Now, I thought he was good. Don't get me wrong. That's why he's in this tier. But geez, it could have been a very good or elite day. It really could have. He had so many opportunities it felt like to score. But the further he got up the ground, the more sure of himself he looked. He was able to use his pace and turn his Brisbane defenders inside out and looked ultra dangerous all day. So I've got to give mass credit to him for that. Charlie had the better of Braden Maynard for a quarter and a half and threatened to get momentum to Brisbane's way in a way that would have made them won the game. I thought Ryan Lester was probably the most underrated defender on the day, and Harris Andrews, we've spoken about the he and Billy Frampton battle, thought he was really, really good. Not only did he win a few contests, and of course had more intercept possessions than anyone else on the ground, but his spoil work was really good, didn't concede a contested mark for the entire game. What more could you want from your fullback? I'm not really sure, so that's why he sits so highly here. But let's get to the very good, and then let's get to the elite, because these players deserve to be celebrated for being amongst the best on the ground. And there are the very goods. Josh Dunkley was Brisbane's best inside player and still side bottom was the best winger on the ground. I love Joey Danaher's game. He's really turned around his finals reputation in this series. The way he took bodies, the way he got on the lead, the way he burnt Darcy Moore on a couple of occasions, I thought he was genuinely fantastic in this grand final. And hopefully the opinion of him in big games is starting to turn amongst neutral footy fans. Pendlebury's last quarter was amazing. The story was fantastic. And I thought Jordan DeGoey made the most of his disposals nearly more than any other player on the ground. That big goal late in the last quarter is going to be remembered. But also everything that he did looked like it was turning to gold. So we got to give credit for that. Now, there are some media outlets that I think are underrating his game for sure. There are some media outlets I think that are maybe overrating his game a touch. This spot for me Feels beautiful. The same with Pendlebury. His last quarter, 10 disposals stood up, did everything that you'd ask a player to do. I don't mind that at all. A Norm Smith medal vote, though? Can't say I agree with that. But, my God, they were very good on the day. And let's count down the elite players. Let's start with Jeremy Howe. The 24 disposals, the 9 marks, and, of course, finishing the game with 3 broken ribs, which is amazing. Don't get me wrong at all. I kind of don't like the three rib story because when putting this list together, I was totally ready to be like, he was the most underrated player on the ground, in my opinion. And now he's not because everyone knows that he's got the broken ribs. Now that is tongue in cheek, of course. How do you not love Jeremy Howe as a bloke, as a player, as a high flyer? I know Melbourne fans might not be, you know, that massive on him at the moment, but I mean, what a player. He was so sure, so mature. It was the right decision to play him down back because he thwarted Brisbane on so many occasions. And what a star. What a bloke. What a player. Deserves it all. A massive congrats to Jeremy, obviously. Speaking of underrated, Brisbane's second best player on the ground for mine was Hugh McCluggage, and I've got him at number six here. He did everything. It was such a well-rounded performance. Sure, he didn't get the 25-30, and he didn't have the 26 and kick two like he did in that qualifying final, but everything he did was with purpose. He glided across the ground. He looked a class above on big moments, or on in big moments, I should say. I'll learn how to talk in a minute. Luckily, that's not kind of what I need to do here. But he marked well above his head. He tackled. He pressured. He used his pace. He stayed in the game. 
for long periods. Now, I know being the second best player in a losing grand final isn't going to mean a whole lot. And yes, I do love Hugh McCluggage as a player, but that's got nothing to do with where he's ranked here. But he was genuinely fantastic. And I hope that when we get to sort of the season previews, of 2024 and when you know other creators and such are talking about Brisbane I hope this gets brought up because I thought he was genuinely fantastic got Nick Dacos at five had more disposals than anyone else on the ground and I actually kind of sympathize with him a little bit because they're the neutral fans are talking about the things like the ducking and all these kinds of things and I believe Nick Dacos is going to fall into the Joel Selwood trap here, and that is he's going to be the best player in the league that does this thing that fans don't like so he's the only one that's going to get it talked about. Yes, Luke Shuey's copped a lot of criticism throughout his career as a ducker. Nowhere near enough as Joel Selwood. They both did it. I'm a Hawthorne fan. We went through five years of Geelong beating us every single time we played. And Joel Selwood was a ducker. So was Paul Puopolo and not one Hawthorne fan used to talk about that. James Sicily did it very young in his career. It happens. Blokes on every team have it, but because Nick Dacos is going to be the best player in the league that routinely does this, it's going to get brought up. Yes, Jack Inovan is going to get the limelight for that reason, but give it two years from now, if Nick's still doing this, I think he's going to cop more criticism than Jack. That's just my opinion. Showed some real class and composure throughout the entire day. The one thing that's kind of going under the radar here is as Brisbane were coming in that last quarter... There was a really poor effort at tackling at Brisbane's half-forward line late in the game that, if Brisbane had a won, I don't think would have looked great in the review. But overall, it can seem a little bit nitpicky, these little things for Nick. What more could you ask for for a 20-year-old playing in his first grand final? Number four, Jack Crisp. Kick goals, found plenty of the ball. His metres gained were electric, thought he was fantastic. And every single time the Pies needed to find some open space, it was him. I would have thought it would have been a Josh Dacos or a Steel side bottom, but it wasn't. It was Jack Crisp, and I don't really know what to say about Crispy here. He the Expectation versus performance, he was fantastic. The way he used the footy was pretty good. The way he kicked some big, big goals, enormous. What it reminded me of was kind of Isaac Smith's role during that 13, 14, 15 period for the Hawks. Crisp didn't play on a wing the entire time, we know that, but... Isaac was consistently a top five player in those grand finals because of his ability to break lines, kick goals, and all these sorts of things. That's what Jack Crisp's game reminded me of. And the Crispy, the Quispy, the great man, he's got a flag now, and that's what we love for him. Brisbane's best player, Kitty Coleman, that first half. I mean, we talk about first halves winning blokes, Norm Smith medals, and we're going to talk about that just in a little bit, but... This dude's tough. Uh, I was feeling really, really good about that smoky Norm Smith medal at $34 call in my grand final preview. Understand why he didn't get it. Would he have won it if Brisbane had won the flag? Probably, which makes number three a little bit difficult to swallow. I understand that four points separating a guy from potentially number three to number one. I get it. I really do. But his composure was great. Toughness was great. Thought his ability in the contest to put his head over it really did justify how tough that I thought he was, but the ball skill. Oh, when this bloke's got it, just, my goodness, seriously. Oh, just amazing. I don't remember what poll I, uh, it was, and I can't actually remember which player I put in a poll with him, but it was Kitty Coleman versus someone as who's the better player, and no one gave love to Kitty, and I reckon they're going to give him some love now. Number two, stunned he didn't get more love in the Norm Smith medal voting, but Tom Mitchell was the second best player on the ground. Bloke laid 13 tackles, had plenty of the footy, did it all. When Collingwood needed the ball out of congestion, it was Tommy Mitchell. When you ask the question, why did Collingwood trade for Tom Mitchell? That grand final performance answers the question. And I know Hawthorne fans are pissed off. You can be, you don't have to be, whatever it is. Personally, I'm not annoyed at all. Collingwood got everything they needed. Hawthorne are going to get everything they need out of their midfield in the future. Collingwood won the trade today. In three years from now, Hawthorne are hoping to win that trade. So that's what I'm going to say about that. But moving to Titch, the Collingwood player, he was enormous. Didn't try to do too much with the ball. Was at the bottom of every pack. Like I said, laid 13 tackles. It was an enormous day. It really was. I would have given him Norm Smith medal votes. Okay. I did uh, on the uh, Amber Ales scrolling through Twitter, going through my votes. My instinctual votes would have had him as the third 
ranked player on the ground. Watching the game back, even drunk Daz had underestimated how well he played. What a player. Don't, don't you dare come to me, anyone, and tell me that meters gained is everything in a player. Go watch that performance because you're wrong. Trust me. And, of course, number one, the Norm Smith medalist, Bobby Hill. He was so far the best player at three-quarter time, it wasn't funny. He and Kitty Coleman were sort of 1 and 1A one at half time, in my opinion. But by three-quarter time, it was Bobby. He could have kicked six, genuinely. He kicked four goals, too. And I honestly reckon those two set shots that he missed might have been amongst the four easiest that he had for the day, which was simply extraordinary. But open space in that forward half... He found a ton of it, but four goals too. The pass to Pendlebury to set up that goal as well, extremely selfless. Reminded me of Stevie J going round the back, getting the handball off Tommy Hawkins, who was going through a bit of a yips period at the time. Uh, in terms of the selflessness, not in terms of the uh, the situation or anything like that, Bobby Hill was flushing them beautifully, but in terms of selfless forward half play, that stands out for mine. He was fantastic, the best player on the ground and thoroughly deserving of the Norm Smith medal. So there you go, guys. What do you think? Comment below, let me know. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe to join the Daz Talks footy family. What would you change? What would you stay the same? I'm looking forward to hearing all of it. I've got draft stuff coming this week, Sunday. I know it's a weird day to upload, but I wanted to get this out as quickly as possible. You have yourselves a fantastic rest of the weekend. I hope your post-grand final week goes well. Stick around because there's plenty to come on Daz Talks Footy, and I will see you all very, very soon.